Welcome to the 415th episode of the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Hagenbotham, and your co-host, Kevin Tofel. And we have a lot to talk about. Maybe a little less than usual, but I think we're going to have some strong opinions. So we're going to be hearing about Belkin's decision not to support Matter. We're going to be talking about, I'm not going to call them delays. We're just going to get an update on Matter from some players in the universe. Nanoleaf actually has new Matter certified lights. We care about that. We're also going to get an update on things Google is killing that is relevant to the IoT. There are two. We've got a new chip, an ultra-wideband chip from Samsung to talk about, giving us precise location. We've also got an update on Unibiz's unified LP WAN that I wrote about and I think talked about the last few weeks. They've added a new partner. And Wise has a new product. It's not matter certified. I'll just tell you that now. We're also going to hear from our guest, the CTO of Nordic Semiconductor. He is Svein Egel Nielsen. And we're going to be talking about new wireless standards for the IoT. We're going to be talking about security and even a little update on Wi-Fi 6. Woo! And he'll be up right after our sponsor, Influx Data. So all of this and more awaits you. But first, a message from one of our sponsors. This week's sponsor is Silicon Labs. They are a leader in secure, intelligent wireless technology, and they've launched their 2023 Tech Talks schedule. Tech Talks include a dedicated technology series for Matter, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and LP WANs, so it was to help you build the development skills needed to deliver cutting-edge IoT products. You can join Silicon Labs experts and industry leaders for these one-hour virtual trainings created by, created for developers by developers. Tune in, ask questions, and accelerate your device development today. You can register now at scilabs.com. Okay, Kevin, let's talk about the big news that launched like right after we recorded the podcast. And this will be our matter section of the show, I have a feeling. Yeah, this is everything that matters about matter. Mm-hmm. And even things that may not matter. Will matter matter? Oh my gosh. Okay. So <laughs> that's the open question, it feels like, because The Verge, they they did it. They asked Belkin. They were like, hey, you said you were going to do some matter stuff, and you didn't. And <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and they said that over a year ago. Yeah. Well, in you know the last few years, I've been putting on these panels for Silicon Labs actually on Matter. And Carl Johnson from Belkin Wemo was one of my most recent panelists, and he was like, "Yeah, we're 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 doing it." But instead, when asked about Matter, Jen Wei, the VP of Global Communications and Corporate Development at Belkin, said. Quote, matter will have a significantly positive impact on the smart home industry. Belkin has decided to, quote, take a big step back, regroup and rethink, unquote, its approach to the smart home. They did say that they'll bring matter products to market when it can find a way to differentiate them. And you know what? Good for them. We have said forever that matter is going to commoditize basic stuff. Yeah. Will they be able to is the question. Yeah, well, that's the, I mean, (laughs) (laughs) yes. So good for them for saying, hey, this is going to come out. I mean, I kind of feel like we, that's one of the first things we talked about, like way back in the day when it was announced, we're like, ooh, if you're going to make hardware, you're going to have to make a lot more than hardware. You're going to have to make it real cheap. We we kind of had a glimpse of this or, or wondered when their last dimmer or light switch came out not too long ago. It was after the Matter spec was officially released in October, but it was not a Matter switch. And we're like, huh, it wasn't even going to be Matter upgradable. That was the other thing. We were like, huh. And and in fairness to them, uh, they did say at CES 2022, the three of their products, uh, the plug, a switch and something else would come out with Matter that year. And Matter was pushed back that year. So I, I, I can understand why 2022 didn't happen. But now it seems like all bets are off. Yeah. And you know what? It makes sense. And we're going to talk about Nanoleaf launching their Matter Lights in a minute. And if you are a product maker and you're just making hardware, you don't have this like extra software compatibility, this is going to commoditize your business. And right now, Matter 
quality silicon is expensive. And it's expensive because and it's expensive because you're adding these new radios, you're adding this security layer. There is a lot going on here. But I will say, I think in a year or two, if you don't have a matter certified product, your differentiation is going to be like, why would you have that product? Because it's not going to be considered as secure. It's not going to be as easy to implement. So maybe don't rush. The other thing I will note, and we've seen this from other companies, they're pulling back on their plans to upgrade or pushing the timeline for updating their old existing gear to matter. So Nanoleaf is still committed to doing it the last we heard, but they're pushing that out. And I'm still waiting for Philips Hue to tell me when they're going to release their stuff. And then Kevin, you just published an update from some other companies. Well, with some help from you, I was actually reaching out to Nanoleaf because I, we were talking about their new products, which we'll get to in a minute. But on top of the Belkin Wemo news, we reached out to Wise and Yale because Wise, they don't, they never really came out and said anything about matter. Um, but we asked for like some clarification and this is what they said. Quote, we recognize that matter has great potential. We're closely monitoring its progress. If we do choose to support matter in the future, and the, I'm putting the emphasis on those words. We likely won't announce any roadmap plans ahead of time. Any future matter supported products will likely show up as a product announcement or press release at the time of launch. I didn't like the if we choose to support matter comment. So Wise has always been a little hesitant on matter. They waited until like 2021 to join the CSA, the organization that does matter, because a lot of their products, their hero product is a smart home camera, right? And Matter does not support cameras. Exactly. And they have some sensors, you know, they've got a, we'll talk about their deadbolt, but all in, I can see why they would be waiting, but they did join. And I know that they've got, they've been playing with the code. They didn't love some of the code and Wise is already kind of aware that it's commoditized. So I feel like they're a great company to actually push Matter. So if they don't, that's going to tell us something but we still have time. Right. And then Yale came out with their Assure Lock 2 back in September, which was a month before the official Matter release. So at that time, it wasn't Matter ready or Matter certified, but they promised a, an upgrade module that you'd be able to swap out in both the Assure Lock 2 and the original Assure Lock, which is actually kind of neat. So they're going to have a Matter upgrade module for the lock. It's been eight months. There's no module for the lock. And we asked them about that just to see if they still expect to offer the module. And they said, yes, we absolutely will. And we will have more specific messaging in the coming weeks. So at least they haven't said no, but I don't know what the holdup may be. Yes. I mean, I, I'm guessing that, you know, it was just a little bit more complicated of a lift to get from point A from the code on GitHub to your products and make sure that it's rolling out properly. And and this makes sense because Yale's going to charge you. I, I don't remember how much they're going to charge for the modules. I think it was like $79 or yeah. 59 one of those. So, you know, they don't want, they don't want that to be bad. Well, yeah. I mean, if, if you're going to ask customers to pay more now for a not inexpensive lock to begin with, you better make sure that it delivers on what, they're adding to it. I feel like I should also tell you that we reached out to Yale because they just updated their Assure Lever Locks. Now you can get it with Wi-Fi. Woo! You were able to get it with Z-Wave, and now you'll be able to get one with Wi-Fi. And that's going to be $230, bucks, two twenty nine ninety nine dollars if you, if you care. Okay. So those are like who's not doing matter. And there's really like, there's a real shortage of matter certified product. I shouldn't say shortage. I know it's only been a few months, right? But everyone was like, oh, it's coming out in the spring and spring has now sprung. Thank goodness. And I'm hoping we'll see a lot more because right now I've got like, I've got the Eve plug that you have to upgrade, which is a hard lift. Now in March, they said they'd start selling matter certified stuff. So you wouldn't have that lift. I don't know if they're out yet. I have not heard anything on that front. So it may be that the next time I'm at Best Buy and I look at Eve's stuff, I'll be like, is there a little Matter brand on it? Technically, if, if you want to be official, official about spring, spring officially started this week. True. Up here in the Pacific Northwest, it actually did start. Usually spring starts in my heart way before it actually registers on the temperature here. So Aww. I know. 
It's always spring in my heart. Okay, so we may or may not be able to buy the Eve stuff yet. And we've got the TP-Link Tapo brand matter plug. And then we have the Maras plugs. And then we have a gajillion controllers. And that's kind of all we have right now. So I'm I'm kind of like... I should say only because I found this out from one of our, our readers on the site that the Philips Hue matter upgrade for the Hue Bridge, it has not come out to the public yet. However, back in November, one of our readers, I'm pretty sure he listens to the show as well, he's part of the Philips Hue developer program, so he has the upgrade and says it's been working really well. So I'm presuming we're going to get that very soon. I hope so, because, man, I... I mean, I can do only so many things with smart plugs and yeah. Yeah. And honestly, like if you're doing it from an Android, it's fine. If you're doing it from Apple, as we talked about, it's not fine. And there's still a lot of confusion as we're about to explain because Nanoleaf has released their, can you pre-order them now? Are they on sale now? You can purchase some of the new products right now and you can pre-order some others. Um, so these are matter certified, so you don't need to firmware upgrade them or anything. These are brand new products. It's all part of the new Nanoleaf Essentials Matter line. We have some bulbs and some light strips. The bulbs are A19 and those are $19.99 each or a three pack for $49.99. Order those today. They're shipped in mid-April. Same with their new smart light strip. There's a two meter starter pack for $49.99 and one meter extensions are only $12.99, which is nice. Also order now, delivery mid-April. Next month, which is April, you'll be able to order the BR30 for $49.99 and later this year, a GU10 and recessed downlight. So aside from having thread radios in all of these for the matter support, they all support white colors in temperatures from 2700 to 6500 Kelvins, I believe it is. It is Kelvins. Yeah. Um, they also... Not Kevins. Not Kevins. Um, one is, you know, we don't want 6500 Kevins. Um, they also have 16 million colors. They can have the... Control them in the app for your scenes, dynamic lighting, etc. So all, all the bulbs and the light strips all have those same attributes, which is very nice. And the bulbs are a little brighter than I would have expected. The brightness on the A19 is maximum of 1100 lumens. The average is 809, they say. Yeah. And, you know, I've been testing smart bulbs. I remember when Philips Hue came out, they were super dim. They were like at 800. And now they're at like 1100 on the whites. I'm assuming the brightest is the bright white. And it really makes a difference. Again, living here in the cold, dark Pacific Northwest, uh, <laughs> I was like, I must replace all of these bulbs. <laughs> Give me more lumens. And I will say, I had one of the original Nanoleaf Essentials bulbs, and they were great. It was 20 bucks, but it was a white only. It comes in that funky shape. Oh, that... don't make me say it. I'm going to make you say it. Ha ha ha. Rhombo Cosido do... Rhombo Cosido decahedron. Wow. Yeah, it's it's a lot. So this actually still has the funky shape, but it adds the color for the price. And this is actually a really good price. 20 bucks for a white and color bulb is really good. Yeah. Um, the three pack win. is a good deal. I think you saved 10 bucks there. Yeah. So if you're in the market for new lights or maybe you're on your like first gen Philips Hue before they got bright, get rid of them, swap them out, put this guy in and you'll be matter upgraded. Woo. Except now here's <laughs> where matter is still a little funky. If you're going to put these in your home, your best experience is going to be, so you're probably going to want to load them with an Android device <laughs> since Apple is still kind of, eh. Um, maybe yeah, we're still waiting for the uh, HomeKit architecture upgrade, which I hear is in the 16.4 developer beta now. So if that works, it's coming. Okay, good. And it'll work with Google Home stuff, so that could be your controller, because you're going to need a controller, because these are thread only, not Wi-Fi. That's where some of the cheapness comes in, I imagine, or the lower cost. Or a SmartThings controller. Eventually, you will be able to use the Amazon Echo devices as a controller, but not yet, because Amazon for now is supporting only Wi-Fi, matter over Wi-Fi, not matter over thread, because it's still testing things out. So... We're just in this like really wonky, confusing time. So, yeah, I kind of feel like the controllers should have been ready first, but I do understand and appreciate Amazon's position when you have tens of millions of Echo devices out there to support this. You don't want to host 
existing functionality up. So, yeah. And I'm seeing my, my Eero thread radios are now on. So maybe soon we'll, we'll see get there. We're getting there. All right. We're going to move away from matter and we're going to talk about Google. So this is pretty short. Google, it's constantly killing things, which I mean, I guess it's good, but we get so excited because Google stuff is sometimes really cool and really innovative. And then they're like, they give it like a year and then they're like, never mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they're no longer going to support Google Glass. Which really had, had been gone from the consumer space for a while now, but was still in the enterprise. There was an enterprise version. Yeah. Now, Microsoft has backed off of their HoloLens. They laid off a whole bunch of people in their HoloLens, which is another AR Glass product. And I'm really wondering about the future of AR Glass in industrial settings. And it seemed compelling as a heads-up display for people. And these were lighter, kind of friendlier things. And I guess there it, it is a pain, like charging them and, you know, Either connecting them to a PC or a phone, some of them. Yeah, I'm guessing that it's not working out super well. And then the military did a big HoloLens trial, and they found it not great. They found people got sick. They didn't like it. Um, so I think we're still a ways off on this front, unfortunately. Um, yeah, yeah. The other thing. I thought the next thing was cool, but I'm glad I didn't buy it. Yeah. The other thing is Google shutting down the Jacquard Smart Fabric app. And Jacquard was, it was developed by Google ATAP. It was back in 2015. It's basically a way to control something um, using touch sensors and haptic feedback in fabric. And I thought it'd be cool, like you could embed it into couches and like put your remote control in your couch. Or in this case, they made a jacket and a backpack and let you control the volume of something on your backpack. In as an interface, I still think this has a lot of potential, but I also think some of these things are longer lived, and unless unless it's Google's operating it. <laughs> and so, what happens is you don't want to buy something that has a market problem. You don't want to buy something that might die before the article it's in dies. Like a Levi's jacket can last for decades. Yeah, maybe not a backpack, but. Also, it was expensive, and I guess the use case was not super compelling. That's the thing. I mean, a lot of these are interesting and cool technology approaches, but are they really solving a major problem at a cost that people will like and provide the use cases people want? Unfortunately, not. Yeah. And will it scale? Not in this case. So that's that's where these are going. So the app is going away. And At least you can still wear your jacket. The zipper still works. Yeah. You, you <laughs> and it looks like that some of your existing Jacquard backpacks and jackets are not going to function when it shuts down because the companion apps are going to go away. The Adidas made insoles using Jacquard that may stick around. It's not clear if they're doing a separate app that is not using Google's. And again, this is that market problem. You've got to be super confident before you buy something that's embedded in this. And if no one is, then it's going to fail. Okay, let's talk about chips. Samsung has a new ultra wideband chips. This is its first ultra wideband chipset. You could, this compares to like Apple's U1 chip. So this is the Exynos Connect U100. Isn't that interesting that it's the U100? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And ultra wideband is exciting because it is a way to really finely get location. So to position. So Apple uses it to like tell you where an air tag is within centimeters, um, as opposed to using something like GPS, which is like it's nearby within 30 feet. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, like <laughs> that's 10 great. Meters. I'm in my living room and I can't find the UWB remote. Um, where is it? <laughs> yeah. So. We're excited about this because, you know, we lose a lot of things in our home and just knowing something's in your home is not helpful, right? And it's also useful for things like unlocking a car, knowing that you're very close to your car and it's safe to unlock. You don't want to lock your car, unlock your car when you're yards away from it. So this is great. The downside is this is not going to, I mean, these are not interchangeable standards. They they use the same underlying radio standard, but your Samsung Exynos UWB chip 
is not going to work with your Apple phone. Um, to like anything using this chip is not going to. But they both have work. you in the name. I know. I know. Oh. They both use ultra wideband. I know. <laughs> now. There are efforts to change this. There are several, like the Car Connectivity Consortium. They want to do a UWB standard for digital keys. Um, I'm sure everyone can participate in that. But again, this is one of those issues where I'm like, gosh, y'all, this technology is so cool. It could be so great. It would be so much greater if everyone could use the same thing because then we'd all, like you wouldn't have that market problem we just talked about with Google, right? Right, right. Uh, But anyway, Samsung's in on this. Yay. And that means we could see cool UWB stuff in in Samsung phones. Probably. Probably. All right. Uh, Other things to note. Also in you news, Unabiz. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, dear. Unabiz, which is a low power wide area networking provider. They do devices, they do networks, they do all kinds of stuff. They also bought Sigfox, which was another LP WAN. Laura is a very popular LP WAN. Unibiz is doing what they call a unified LP WAN. We wrote about that. We've been talking about this. They just signed a deal this week. A couple of weeks ago, it was a deal with the Things Industry for bringing their Laura software platform. Last week, it was Senate. Um, they're doing a, a deal where Senate's, which is a Laura network here in the US, now Senate's customers can range over onto other lore networks elsewhere. And Senate can use, like help their customers build devices that work on Laura and things like Sixbox using help from Unibiz. So win-win for just generic LP win. And now Unibiz has signed a deal with, I don't know if it's Laura IoT or Laureat. I think it's Laureat. I think it's Laureat too. Okay, good. I <laughs> You think I don't talk to people, but the problem is once I read something, I'm like, well, I think it sounds like this. I'll forget everything. The the problem is there's these acronyms now in every name and you're like, so we're using the acronym or is it part of your name or do we speak the word? Yeah. And so this is a similar deal. This is a Swiss IoT company. They do two LP wins. They do Laura and then they do their own called, well, it's actually not their own. It's a Canadian company. It's called Miodi. Um, And Miodi is a LP WAN for like highly dense networks. So basically, Unibiz is like, bring me your LP WANs. We will consolidate it and deal with it. So it's a theme. This is this year's theme for them. And then finally, in some product news, we've got a new Wise product. We do. We have the new Wise Lock Bolt just introduced this week. You can purchase it now for $73.99. What's interesting about this one, at least from a wise perspective, aside from having a keypad to put in like a pin code to unlock your door, it also has a fingerprint sensor. The keypad is connected to the lock with Bluetooth. If you have a wise video doorbell pro, there's a new option in there to unlock the door, which is kind of nice. They say the fingerprint unlock takes about a half a second, which is great. Yeah, I mean, it's new for them. It's it's good if that's what you want. I I still love my NFC lock that I just put my Apple Watch on my lock face and walk in. But we also have a keypad, so I don't have keys on most of my doors anymore. Right, but same, same. I yep. also I don't have an. Apple you should Watch, always so. have two ways to get in. Yeah, well, the downside is like we did see what was it. Dan from Consumer Reports, his, I think it was a Yale Assure. It was their Yale Assure lock, and that broke. <laughs> right, it just died. It, it just bricked the lock, so he couldn't get in at all. Um, yeah. So that is kind of a downside. Yeah. They do have another interesting feature, which I can I appreciate. Uh, my lock does not have this. Their anti-peep technology. So if somebody's watching you put in your code, right, if it's a four-digit code, it's pretty easy to kind of guess and see what somebody put in what you can do is put in random digits before and after the correct code and they won't know which of the digits are oh so you could just like put in random numbers and then as, as long as your code is in there it just take me three minutes to unlock the door hold on one two three seven four times <laughs> yeah get that fingerprint out yeah and i i'm a big fan of keyed like i like that this has a keypad as opposed to like i've got a lock right now that has it's a touch sensitive lock. Mm-hmm. I hate it. My hands are always too cold. I don't even know what's wrong with them. Like it, <laughs> it is just the glitchiest thing. It's the Eufy. I'll just tell you, it's the Eufy fingerprint lock. 
Um, and it also, it hates reading my fingerprints. By the way, as you age, your fingerprints go away. Okay. They get harder to read. That could well be. You know what I really like, though? Last feature, and then I'm done with this one. Okay. You know how a lot of these locks, they run on battery, and we joke about it, but we're serious of having a 9-volt battery somewhere to like kind of jumpstart it to get in your house? Mm -hmm. They have a USB-C port at the bottom. So like if you have a phone or something else with you and a, and a USB-C cord, <laughs> well, a lot of people do. I keep one in my car. Exactly. Exactly. Just put your phone or USB-C external battery or whatever right in there and you can get in your house. Yay. Clever. Yeah. Nice. All right. Well, that's this segment of the show. And now it's time for the Internet of Things podcast hotline, the segment of the show where we listen to you. Actually, we hear from you. Hopefully, you should give us a call at 512-623-7424, and you will be entered to win a Hubitat. It's a Hubitat. I was like, what is it, Stacy? She had to think about that. Yes. I did have to think about it. And this part of the show is sponsored by Very. end-to-end -end IoT engineering and design firm. You can partner with Vary to work through complexity and deliver business value rapidly. Learn more at verytechnology.com. All right. So this week's question, man, we used to get this all the time. We haven't in a while. So, and there's so many more new options. I figured let's hear it and we will, we will discuss all the options. All right. Here it is. Hi, I have a question about light switches that may not require a ground or neutral wire. I have an old X10 switch that just has the load and the hot, and it has worked fine with before getting any LED lighting. Now the LED lighting doesn't give enough of a voltage drop for the X10 to work. Most switches, or all the switches I've seen, don't require at least a neutral wire in order for them to work. Do you know of any that don't require so I don't have to open up the wall and replace all the wiring? Thank you very much. Okay. It used to be that I had one answer for you, and that was Lutron. Mm -hmm. um, and that was it. But now the world has expanded so many more. And by the way, though, with light switches, the smarter they are, the more you're going to need the neutral wire. And if you have a neutral wire, do not skimp. Mm -mm. You must connect the neutral wire. Okay. That's my little public safety, my PSA right there. All right. There are a lot. None of them are X10. I'm assuming that you're replacing your old X10 light with something and you wanted a neutral wire. So we're going to post this. We'll post it this weekend. Um, you'll see the story with all of the options. But Lutron still has a lovely option. It is the Diva Smart Dimmer. And it's not cheap. <laughs> it is not cheap. And if you want it to actually connect to anything, you actually have to use the hub. So you may not like this, but I always, you know, everyone knows I love Lutron because it freaking works and it's so easy to connect and I love it and it's seamless. Anyway, if you have Lutron, the Diva Smart Dimmer is your friend. It will work for you. And then there's uh, the Embrightened. We've talked about that. That's a Z-Wave Smart Dimmer. No neutral wire there. Yes. And then... Decora has one. It looks like all the others. It's a Leviton Decora. You also need a Wi-Fi bridge for this one, but it does work with everything. It's the DN6HD-1BW. I know. <laughs> and then GE, GE Sync actually put out some great dimmers that don't have a neutral, and they're really easy to install. I think they're hideous, but... They're a weird design. I will, I will grant you that. Yeah, so do pay attention because it is not like a normal light. And it's also expensive. It's it's forty nine ninety eight. It's fifty bucks. It's actually among the cheaper options here, to be honest. Yeah. Okay. Fine. <laughs> but this one is Wi Fi, so you don't need a hub. That's right. the moral of this one. This one doesn't need a hub and it works with Madame A and Google. They may have a home kit certified one, I don't know. Yeah, and again, we're presuming you're not looking for a new X10 switch with no neutral wire here because we started looking around and found some forum posts from about six years ago talking about things, but mm -mm. doesn't exist. All right. So we'll include some more in there if you would like to read about it, but there are many options. 
depending on your setup, if you wanted to talk to a hub, if you, I mean, depending on all kinds of things. Honestly, I, if you still want to keep the X10, I think it's easier to swap that out than start ripping your walls out to get neutral wires in there. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. That's crazy. Okay. That concludes this segment of the show, but please stay tuned for our guest, Svein Egel Nielsen, who is the CTO of Nordic Semiconductor. We're going to be talking about all kinds of things, tiny ML, energy harvesting, Wi-Fi, so much. And, oh, and Decked NR, which is a massive IoT standard in We'll explain what the heck that is. We've talked about it on the show before, but this is like this alternative standard, and apparently everybody in Scandinavia is really excited about it. So you'll learn about that. But first, a message from our sponsor. This week's sponsor is Influx Data. Hey everyone, we are taking a quick break from the Internet of Things podcast for a message from our sponsor. This week's sponsor is InfluxDB, and I have Brian Mullen, the Chief Marketing Officer at InfluxDB, here to talk to us about the database and some of its customers. Today's customer is Magic. Brian, what is InfluxDB? InfluxDB is a platform for developers to handle time series data at scale. To give you an idea what time series data is, it's really just data that is stamped in time in some way. And that could be hours or minutes or seconds or even nanoseconds. Handling this type of data is pretty difficult and time consuming and InfluxDB makes it simple and fast. And so developers can ingest, store, and analyze all types of time series data. And that covers metrics, events, and traces. And they can do it all on a platform that is designed to handle the high speed and high volume data ingest and real-time analysis. And InfluxDB itself consists of our core database and storage engine, the API, and a surrounding ecosystem of tools and integrations to ingest, query, and analyze that time series data. Sweet. So why does a purposely built time series platform matter to IoT folks? Today, pretty much all IoT data is time series data. It's generated by sensors, systems, and applications that change over time and are you know, therefore time stamped in some way. And so as companies build new IoT systems and applications, the developers themselves working on those just have to keep up with the data, which is growing exponentially. The sources of data in IoT are everywhere. I mean, it could be sensors on a wind turbine, solar panels on a roof, temperature gauges in smart agriculture fields, or even sensors and gauges in a connected car, like the ones we drive every day. And these sources are producing data, things like temperature and usage and battery life, location, speed, engine efficiency. Now multiply all of that by the time intervals. And that's a lot of data. What are some of the challenges associated with this amount of data? First is, you know, pure volume. It's a massive workload of data, exponentially larger than is typical. And second, for a typical database, whether it's relational or document, you know, laboring through so many of these reads and writes really impacts performance. The ingest is slow and the query is even slower. The long-term retention and access becomes really difficult. So if you have tons of very recent or hot data alongside a longer history of older, important, but slightly less relevant cold data, how do you manage both? These are the hard technical challenges that most incumbent DBs are just not able to handle. And so where other DBs and tools fade, InfluxDB really shines. Solving these time series challenges is why InfluxDB exists. So can you tell me a little bit about how your customers are using InfluxDB? Yes. So let's look at an example. Magic makes monitoring software for the manufacturing and processing space. Their product improves what's known as OEE or overall equipment effectiveness within their factories that are running that software. And they use InfluxDB to collect, store, and analyze data that is actually coming from the factory floor in those deployments, providing insights into the operation of the machines and units that are running on that floor. All right. And where can our listeners go to find out more about InfluxDB? The best thing to do is to try the product. And you can do that by going to our website at influxdata.com. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Higginbotham. And today's guest is Svein Egel Nielsen, who is the CTO at Nordic Semiconductor. Hi, Svein Egel. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you for letting me come on your podcast. That's really exciting. I am excited. Uh, that, is, that is the curse of me. I'm perpetually excited about all kinds of technology. The nerdier, the better. And since you are in the semiconductor space. And I believe that if you want to see the future, you go talk to the people that make chips. I think we're going to have a lot of good time, nerdy fun. So to get started, 
Why don't you let people know just briefly what it is that Nordic is trying to do for the IoT? So what we're saying that is we are an IoT enabler. You know, we provide semiconductors and solutions for low power wireless connectivity, the kind of devices and solution that you need for any kind of device that connects to the internet or some other connection. So, so we really, it, it, really, it's, it's, it's about the IoT, it's about sensors, it's about all kinds, all kinds of nerdy stuff, all kinds of crazy things, anything that, you know, we want to connect, control, measure, all these good things. So let's start with wireless, just because it's what y'all do. Y'all have been known for Bluetooth. You've just added Wi-Fi. But I really wanted to ask you about this this decked NR standard that y'all are backing. And I would love to understand both what the heck that is and then how y'all define massive IoT. Or if you even call it massive IoT, maybe you call it ambient IoT. I mean, let's start with the first one. You said what the heck it is. So, so some, some of my colleagues from uh, from Finland came a couple of years ago and says, oh, there's this deck thing. And I said, what is this? There's no phone stuff? You know, because all we knew was decked was phones. And I thought no one had for hands phone phone anymore. And I said, no, no, Sven, this is not just, the, just phones anymore. We're actually making a new standard. I mean, doing something that is going to be for the internet, you know, with uh, for data, for sensors, for any kind of thing. And I, I, of course, we got interested, and and you know, the long story short about it, we we work together with a company, Wirepass in Finland. There's been specification development, and there is really three things I like a lot about the NR Plus. And the first one is that you know it it provides reasonably good range. You can send data over, I will say, conservatively speaking, one to two kilometers range. That is nice. But you can do that with high data rate. You can do that with, uh, you know, maybe 300 kilobits per second data rate. That's pretty significant for, for long range technology. And thirdly, it operates in the decked spectrum. It operates in the 1.9 gigahertz spectrum, which is only reserved for decked and which no one controls apart from the deck standard. So you have these three nice things, range, data rate, and a spectrum you can use without a lot of limitations. There are other, other things like a very robust radio protocol in the bottom and all things like that. But those three elements makes it a very interesting technology for connecting pretty much the whole city infrastructure or a lot of infrastructure. Now, before we get to massive IoT, with DEC, is anyone, is the spectrum being used now? Is it crowded? Not crowded because, you know, remember this decked phones. And I asked, if anyone has a phone like that anymore? I don't. I'd be all using mobile phones. Turns out there's a couple of people in my office that are still using some kind of headset with that. But it's going away. It's going away quickly. And, and the spectrum is there. And this technology, NR Plus, is also very spectrum smart. So it would adapt to the, the density in the spectrum. It can transmit on, 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 on different channels it's using time division multiplexing as well. And it's, it's built to scale significantly in the spectrum. Can you say a little bit more? Because we've had Wirepass on the show to talk about this, and they they talked about being able to monitor, I want to, I, I don't want to make up a number here, but it was a lot of sensors in like one cubic meter. Can you talk about the kind of scale we can see here? So when Wirepass talked about the one cubic meter, usually typically that was also for Bluetooth, their mesh implementation Bluetooth. I think they had thousand sensors in a cubic meter doing mesh. Uh, now we want to do mesh on uh, NR Plus as well. But then we are looking at a range kind of thing. We, we will use the range for meaningless connections. Uh, there's a lot of talk about, you know, factory automation. Uh, you want to connect the street lights outside, for instance. They can all be chained. You want to connect maybe smart meters as well, right? In, a, in, a, in an environment that could be urban or it could even be a non-urban uh, environment. It's almost for the range you get. So um, as a technology, I think it will scale to, to a lot of nodes. And I don't foresee uh, and foresee that the... The density would ever be a problem, the famous last words, but, but uh, it is ready for, for, for prime time to, to really solve problems. Are, are you building anything for this now, or is this like three years out? We have solutions. We have our cellular device, our NRF9160, is capable of running NR+. So right now we're in a software development phase of using this as the first vehicle to enable you know, our customers to start development, and that is happening today. So this year, we expect to see customers adopting uh, our software in 9160 uh, to develop solutions and, and see the market. Strangely enough, is when I go to CES and I also went to Mobile World Congress, there's so many people comes up and talk about NR+. So it seems to have hit some nerves out there, and there's a lot of interest. And we're trying to figure out how we're going to prioritize the interest, you know, and at the same time as we release new versions of the software as we go forward this year. 
Okay. And now let's talk about this concept of massive or ambient IoT. What do y'all call it? What do you, how do you define this? I'm a very simple person, right? I think everything gets connected. Everything gets connected. And I talked about other things in the past, this sort of the, the silent IoT revolution that's happening. Around us, everything gets connected and we stop talking about it. It become, became the norm, right? If I think about my life and the things around me, everything's connected these days. I live in a modern society, right? I, I live in Norway, we have good infrastructure, but I probably have like 30, 40 or 50 things that connects and do stuff with. Whether that is to turn the coffee maker behind me on or off or whatever, it's connected everything. And that's happening in the home, but it's happening outside everywhere. And that's how I think about massive. It just happens everywhere right now. And people don't talk about it that much. You and me talk about it, Stacey. But people just take it for granted now, which is maybe a sign of success. Maybe. They take it for granted, except when it breaks. And one of the ways that I think it breaks is power and changing batteries. Like anytime that, you know, I have, I think I have like a hundred connected things in my house. And like, there's always a battery that I'm changing somewhere. I've got actually, I've got three on my desk today that I'm dealing with. So let's talk about power savings because this year I feel like we're really hitting our stride with better, more efficient energy harvesting technology and then over the air power delivery. So I'd love to get where Nordic is looking when it comes to either of those things, but kind of what is your strategy around creating power sipping modules? So it, you know, the, the reason I think we're seeing more of it right now is, is twofold. First of all, some of the SOCs and the wireless connectivity is at a level where you can operate on energy harvesting. You can actually make it work uh, meaning, meaningful because the baseline technology is becoming so good. And that trend keeps going forward. The second trend is that you're seeing this, this push to not use so much batteries. Uh, and and as, as you said, the states is you don't want to necessarily charge or change batteries. So I think the the, the willingness to pay a little bit more from the device makers is there now. And maybe there's a third element too, is that I think, uh, especially in Europe, there's a lot of talk about the, the mountains of batteries and how, well, how are we going to deal with these disposable batteries? I think eventually that will not be, that will be something the makers have to solve. So we see a lot of interest to find energy harvesting solutions. And I think that as we move forward, it's going to be a, a very important part of the baseline products we make and the solutions we make around it to make it work. It's coming and it, and it seems to be coming faster than we thought just a couple of years ago. Yeah, I think it's great. So how are y'all planning to address this? I don't want to go in details with you how we're planning to address it. I, I, what I will say is that we are working on it and we are planning to address it in, in the way we would like to see and in the way that it works very well with our devices. Uh, there are, as you, as you mentioned, a lot of companies out there. We partnered with some of them on, on reference design and so forth. But uh, going forward, there will be products. I mean, there's so many good opportunities to do energy harvesting in many ways. So one of the most funny things we, we talked a lot about recently we promote is that someone made a cellular connected uh, tracker to put on a bird to track migration of the birds. And the way they can actually manage to get it to go fairly far was to use a little solar panel on the top. Now, it wasn't enough maybe to bring it all the way to, to where it needed to go, but it's an example of, of what happens. We see other trackers that are bigger in size that just use solar. We have seen uh, sensors that go into the ground that using the temperature difference between the ground and the, 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 the ambient. So I also, I mean, in my home, and uh, I have a remote control from, from Samsung for my TV, which is a tiny bit of a solar panel. That's a chargeable thing, but I never charged it. It's been a year and a half, right? Never charged it. I never thought about it. And just, that's just the kind of utility you get now. I didn't have to charge, I didn't have to change batteries. So it happens everywhere. And there is this break point now where I think where the additional cost the OEMs are willing to take because it provides the utility for the customers and, and eventually also the, the lack of the battery problem. Yeah, and there's a big win right now. I think there's a company called Dracula Technologies. There's a big, I think it's very cool, uh, trend towards like printing solar the PVs in ways that you can, that they no longer have to be these tiny little pieces of glass on things. So you can integrate them better into products. And I, I think when we think about energy harvesting, we often think, oh, it's just this one little segment of the market where you're taking advantage of energy harvesting, like temperature differentials or piezo or whatever. But there's actually this whole realm of cool innovations happening. 
Very true. And, and that innovation, of course, brings utility and it maybe lowers the overall cost of the product. Again, making it a better choice for, for, for device makers instead of going back to that either the rechargeable battery or, or the disposable batteries. Okay. And Nordic has fairly recently started building a Wi-Fi business to go along with Bluetooth and other radio technologies. I'm very curious. Do you think we're going to see Wi-Fi 6 in sensors? Of course we are, Stacey. Here's my chip for that. This is Wi-Fi 6 chip here. I have it in my hand. It connects to my network. Yeah. We, the, the thing we want to do with Wi-Fi 6, we want to do Wi-Fi 6 because it provides power-saving modes that is not available in Wi-Fi 5. That is very important. So you can actually get these very long duty cycles that can get very low power in Wi-Fi 6, very efficient on the spectrum. So it, it has a cer- has a, certainly has a lot of benefits for IoT. Got it. All right. Well, I can't not talk to you about one of the most exciting things that I am I am keen on, which is this idea of TinyML. I'm heading into the TinyML Summit at the end of this month. And the idea here is that you can do machine learning on really constrained devices, not just like your cell phone. I'm like, that's, that's medium ML. I don't care. But doing it on a microcontroller, even, you know, a 32-bit microcontroller, probably not much less. So I'd love to hear... I guess if you're seeing any use cases in how Nordic is preparing for this, if it is preparing, maybe you're not excited about it at all. I'm super excited. I'm super excited. And as you said, I was a little surprised a couple of years back when you sort of started to realize that even on our devices, which is constrained in, in some way, like the you know, 64 megahertz kind of 32-bit processor, we're able to do you know kind of nice things. And, uh, and we started a project, we started working together with Edge Impulse, which provides this tool to develop it, which is a really, really nice tool. And we've seen customers that we before and now developing, you know, ML algorithms that runs on our devices. And, you know, typically with, with that kind of processing power and no special acceleration, you can do, you know, vibration detection. You can understand, maybe even you can do understand sound and, and maybe do some very rudimentary image detections, right? But these things are all very relevant. And uh, customers are, are getting used to, to, to that technology. So when we look at our roadmap, we're thinking, so what exactly are we trying to address as we go forward? What is, what is the ML use case for a constrained device on battery? What are we trying to achieve? Certainly, you know, being able to do take sensor data, sort of the vibration part of it, and, and analyze that for anomaly detections, anything, it's, 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 it's a great use case. The second is the audio. That, that is obvious, do keyword spotting. That, that's already algorithms exist. And it's a little big question right now is how much video processing we expect to do and in what platforms. And how are we actually going to segment the, the technology? How much are we going to just use general purpose compute versus doing some acceleration? And we are putting in the, you know, we're looking at all these technologies and some of it is coming in different stages. So it, it's actually, I'm excited about it because we don't know 100% exactly how it's going to look like in, in a few years, but we have an idea and we're playing with it all the time. And, and, you know, as great as it is, you can do it right now. You don't have to wait for some new device. Out. You can start playing with it right away. That is true. I, I was like, I have, I have a little device that will do face detection. It can only recognize three faces, but my family is only three people, so we're good. Um, and I have not tied it up to anything, but I've got the face detection working. And I'm like, hot diggity. That's pretty sweet. Okay, so if I had like a dollar for every tiny ML or super constrained ML chip company out there, I think I would probably have only like $10, but that's still, you know, I'd take it. There are so many startups approaching this in so many different ways. So as a company who I assume is looking out for the best ways to do this kind of technology, I mean, are you seeing anything that's super compelling? I see companies that are like, oh, forget digital. We're going to do, do it all in analog. And then I see companies like adopting Risk Five and designing something particular for them. Is there an area where there's a stronger chance for a company to win in this space? I don't necessarily think so. The things you outline is different ways of solving the problem. And uh, the jury is still out what is the winner. If you come from a very digital world, maybe you will make a digital accelerators, you know, multiple max and, and, and these things. Uh, if you are really into process, maybe you do a custom risk five. You know, that, those are options. And, and the analog things, you know, me being a more digital person myself, that's a, that would be very cool too. But, but I don't think it's, it's given right now. 
And it isn't given also because some of it is better fit for certain. What are you actually going to achieve? And I mentioned that, is it just going to be sensitive? Is it going to be out? Or is it going to be some image or is it going to be full-time video? Exactly what you're going to do is also impacting the, 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 the performance and the power consumption and the cost eventually what to do. So I think there's room for many technologies right now. Yeah, if we think about the concept of massive IoT, if there are going to be sensors everywhere and we think about making them battery powered, having them do some sort of machine learning or some just processing on device, it feels like you could sell, I don't know, 100,000 chips just for wake word detection and stick it in all kinds of things or you know, a million chips just for detecting, is there a car in the spot under the street lamp, right? So it feels so big that the opportunities might be large enough for a bunch of different custom designs. I mean, it, it, there's some huge opportunities. One of the things I think also about is kind of things like health and medical, right? So since I'm becoming a little bit older, I like to be here, it's sort of you starting to go to the doctor more often. And, you know, one thing you got to do the, e, the ECG, you got to measure these things. And also, these things you can start doing with small sensors. And maybe instead of having to go to a doctor, you'd put a patch on yourself that measures some vitals over the, like a two years, two weeks period before you go to a doctor. And, you know, that little chip is going to send it to your phone. And that's going to be running some ML to actually detect when there's an anomaly. So you can go to the doctor and say, you know what, on that Friday, there was something wrong with your heart. And that's a great one. And to the voice detection, why don't you have a cough sensor, that actually a little microphone that measures your coughing. Maybe there's something wrong with your coughing. You can find patterns in that. There's some really, really exciting opportunities that I think could be, be really good for solving big problems. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show this week. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And that concludes this week's episode of the Internet of Things podcast. Please join us next Thursday and don't forget to subscribe. And if you can't get enough IoT news, I would love for you to sign up at www.stacyoniot.com for our weekly IoT newsletter, where we explain all kinds of things that we don't even get to on the show. Once again, thank you for listening and please subscribe. 